Our second speaker this afternoon is Dr. Jeffrey Wainwright. Dr. Wainwright is Robert Earl Cushman, Professor Emeritus of Christian Theology at Duke Divinity School. In addition to teaching and writing broadly in Christian theology, it looks like Dr. Wainwright collects countries. If I've gotten my data correct, he completed degree programs in the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and Italy, served as a missionary for a number of years in Cameroon, held teaching posts in the United Kingdom and the United States, and visiting professorships in the United States, Italy again, and Australia. If we're looking for global perspectives on the spirit, it would seem that Dr. Wainwright is uniquely qualified. As with Dr. Velker, you will appreciate it if I don't try to list all of Dr. Wainwright's published works, but some of his more significant ones for our purposes include Doxology, The Praise of God in Worship, Doctrine, and Life, the co-edited Oxford History of Christian Worship, and Worship with One Accord, Where Liturgy and Ecumenism Embrace. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wainwright. Ja, es freut mich sehr, Herrn Welke kennenzulernen. Mit einigen seiner Kollegen in Heidelberg bin ich schon befreundet. Ja. I also have here an outline which gives, I think, 12, 14 maybe, topics that I'm hoping to cover. Do you have those? Yes. Well, we'll get as far along in them as we can. Yes, yes. I would like to mention also, um, in case any of you are still United Methodist Seminarians here, that the current edition of Catalyst is devoted in its first three or four pages to the Holy Spirit, and you might like to read those pages. The official title of my lecture is The Spirit of God and Worship. My own private title is The Liturgical Grammar of the Holy Spirit. That may indicate to you that I'm going to speak to you as a liturgist and a linguist, perhaps, rather than as a systematic theologian. Never mind. We'll begin with Basil of Caesarea, whose name has already been introduced to us in the course of these last two days. Basil of Caesarea's treatise on the Holy Spirit. Questions concerning the ontological origin, the doxological status, and salvific functions of the Holy Spirit famously reach back at least as far as the fourth century of the Christian era. What became recognized as orthodox answers were theologically argued by Basil of Caesarea in his treatise on the Holy Spirit and liturgically settled in terms of what became the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Among Greek-speaking Christians, Basil established the propriety of addressing the doxology to God the Father, not only through the Son in the Holy Spirit, as the more familiar formula had it, but now also addressing God the Father with the Son, together with the Holy Spirit. And this on the grounds of the second and third person's inner Trinitarian relations. He pointed out that the Syriac Christians had no other linguistic way of coordinating the three persons than by and, which was also the form used, he said, throughout the entire West, almost from Illyricum to the boundaries of the empire in the worshipful address to the Trinity. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. As to the creed, this governed the faith of Christians 
regarding the deity and liturgical roles of the Holy Spirit, finally confessed as Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, and in brackets, and the Son. And with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. From the divine side, it is affirmed that the Spirit spake by the prophets, and the Holy Spirit is recounted as speaking and acting salvifically in narratives of the New Testament. For our part, we shall be reflecting on the Spirit as the goal or as the location and instrument of praise and prayer. That is, the moral, practical, and intellectual functions of the Holy Spirit in relation to creation and the creatures as liturgically expressed in linguistic and gestural interaction with the creatures. And I shall draw examples both from the scriptures and from the classical prayers of the church and the churches. Right from the start, Basil's justification of the coordinated form of doxology, with, with, or and, and, that means that there is no immediate need for suspicion of subordinationism when we encounter or employ the more differentiated forms of address or function in connection with the Holy Spirit. I should say that the Greek text with French translation of Basil's work can be found in the series Source Chrétienne, edited by Benoit Pruche. But you can find from St. Vladimir's Press a nice little English version of Basil on the Holy Spirit. Guided by the scriptural principles and the firm creedal and perhaps matching dogmatic tradition of Christianity, we shall be able to examine several of the historically proven examples of genuinely pneumatic worship with a view to discerning the liturgical grammar of the Holy Spirit. And we should thereby help our own communities to frame and practice in praise and petition recognizably authentic encounters with the triune God in spirit and in truth. John 4:23. Next section, Romans chapters 8 and 15. For a strong scriptural example of the Holy Spirit's salvific standing and liturgical roles, we may appropriately turn to St. Paul's letter to the Romans, and notably to the 8th and the 15th chapters. Of people who are joined to Christ by faith, Romans 3, 21 through 26, and baptism, Romans 6, 1 through 4, it may be said that they are in Christ and that Christ is in them and or that they are in the Spirit and the Spirit of God dwells in them. You'll find those two phrases in Romans 8. To be led by the Spirit is to be sons and daughters of God, Romans 8, 14. It is to have experienced the spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15. We have, says the Apostle, the first fruits of the Spirit, Romans 8, 23. And while we are with the whole creation, awaiting the redemption of our bodies, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, interceding for us by his own ineffable groanings, Romans 8, 26. And the God who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God, Romans 8, 27. Advancing to the 15th chapter of Romans, we may detect a pneumatological watermark underlying the opening verses. The clue occurs in verse 5 of Romans 15. 
the apostle prays for his recipients thus. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement, note those two words, I'll be saying more about them. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to be of one mind among yourselves, according to the will of Christ Jesus, that you may with one heart and one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's worship for you. But what is required to perform it? It is steadfastness, hypomone, a verb, uh, sorry, a, a noun which is often mentioned in a pneumatic context, almost as if it were a gift from the Spirit. You can find that in Romans 5, Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 Thessalonians 1. And not only steadfastness, but also encouragement, paraklesis, the word used in 1 Corinthians 14 and in Philippians 2, suggests the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. So that the Holy Spirit may appropriately then be considered as the divine source to which Paul looks in asking on behalf of the Romans that they may be of one mind, one heart or will, and one mouth or voice in their glorification of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, the phrase in Romans 15, verse 4, dia tes paraklesios tos ton graphon, suggests that in the creation of unity among the believers, which is necessary to the proper worship of God, a part is played by the reading of the inspired scriptures, now of the New Testament, as well as of the Old. In the rest of Romans 15, the Holy Spirit surfaces four times explicitly. The Holy Spirit is mentioned by name in verse 13 as the source of hope directed toward the time when all the Gentiles would come to praise and glorify God, along with his people of the Old Covenant. Paul speaks in liturgical or priestly terms of his own evangelical mission among the nations to that end. He says this, By the grace of God given him, he is a minister, liturgos, liturgist, of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest, the word is the word for priest, the gospel of God. And so that the offering, the prosphora of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And it matters little here whether the genitive, the offering of the Gentiles, is taken as objective or subjective, whether it be Paul's offering of them or their own offering. What Christ wrought through the apostles in winning the obedience of the Gentiles was done by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit, verses 18 and 19 of Romans 15. Finally, Paul's appeal to the Romans by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, verse 30, that he may emerge safely from Judea and visit them on his journey to Spain, verses 24 and 28. All this interweaving between mission, praise, and prayer, between evangelistic witness and the worship of God, is striking. And it all takes place, says Paul, in the Spirit. Next section, the Anglican Collect for Purity of Heart. A first example, a concrete example of a liturgical prayer, we can turn to that beautiful, beautiful prayer that traditionally figures at the opening of the Order of Administration of the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion in the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer and has spread much more widely also. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts 
by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. That prayer would, in fact, be substantially appropriate at the start of any service of Christian worship. Similarly, a phrase from the 13th century figure St. Bonaventura would generally be applicable as a principle for any service of preaching, since he says that the aid of the Holy Spirit has to be petitioned both for preachers and for their hearers. I won't read out the complicated Latin sentence for that. Here I may perhaps recount anecdotally how I was once invited to preach in a Pentecostalist church in Johannesburg, South Africa. And it began my sermon by saying how honored I felt to have been asked to preach there on Pentecost Sunday. But the congregation didn't tumble to that one. No, they said, every Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. <laughs> so we come with that to seasonal prayers for the Spirit. We should look more specifically at pneumatologically marked prayers in the specific services of the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, beginning again with texts that figure as standard in any such celebration, and then come to seasonal prayers appointed for festivals on which the Holy Spirit is prominently named on account of some highlights in salvation history, and where the event or the episode will have been recalled, perhaps, in the prayer or collect of the day and certainly in the scripture readings of the day, such as, for example, the Annunciation to Our Lady Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Or the baptism of Jesus himself. The heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove. On ordinary Sundays in most churches, the standard prefaces of the Eucharistic prayers addressed to the Father make only a passing mention, if any, of the Holy Spirit. But for our purposes, we may turn rather to the preface of a Eucharistic prayer for the Feast of Pentecost and another for Trinity Sunday. In the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church in the United States, the proper preface for Pentecost runs this. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down on this day from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith, and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations." And the Episcopal Church's preface for Trinity Sunday runs this. For with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I move now to a more detailed element in the great prayer of thanksgiving at the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, the so-called epiclesis. In our consideration, then, of the Eucharistic prayer, we come to a feature that dates back to early Christian days and attracted a new measure of attention from liturgists in the 20th century, namely the epiclesis, whereby the Holy Spirit is called upon, epicala is called upon, to come down and consecrate the sacramental elements and energize the people who will partake of them. For the early history of this throughout Christendom as a liturgical feature, there is a book by Cuth Cuthbert Atchley on the Eucharistic, on the epiclesis of the Eucharistic liturgy and in the consecration of the font, the font. Oxford University Press, 1935. And the story is continued in John McKenna's Eucharist and Holy Spirit, the Eucharistic Epiclesis in 20th Century Theology. 
And there, the second part of that book is significantly headed, The Interpretations of 20th Century Liturgists and Theologians, The Epiclesis in the Shadow of the Moment of Consecration Problem. Perhaps the, most, the earliest developed epiclesis is that found in the so-called apostolic tradition of Hippolytus from around the year 220. And it was much noticed in the 20th century. And it runs this. Mindful, therefore, of Christ's death and resurrection, we offer this bread and wine to you, Father, Thankful that you have judged us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. And we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church, gathering together in unity all those who partake of these holy mysteries so that they may be filled with the Holy Spirit unto the strengthening of faith in truth. Thus we may praise and glorify you through your child, Jesus Christ, to whom and be glory and honor to you, Father and Son, with your Holy Spirit, in your Holy Church, now and forever. Coming into the present time, I could quote, oh, half a dozen epicletic prayers from the Roman Missal, but that might not be quite appropriate here, I'm not sure. But I'll just quote one of you from the Second Eucharistic prayer in the current Roman Missal, English translation, 2010. You indeed are holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then straight into the institution narrative. And then humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. And the various other Eucharistic prayers in the current Roman Missal go along very much the same lines. But just to show that I'm a Methodist, I have brought John and Charles Wesley's hymns on the Lord's Supper. We can find examples of epiclesis among the 166 Wesleyan hymns on the Lord's Supper. Did you know there were 166 hymns by John and Charles Wesley devoted to the Lord's Supper? Well, you can buy them for about $5. I think you ought to invest in that. Most straightforward is hymn number 72. Come, Holy Ghost, thine influence shed, and realize the sign. Thy life infuse into the bread, thy power into the wine. Effectual let the tokens prove, and made by heavenly art, fit channels to convey thy love to every faithful heart. And then again, the Wesleyan hymn number 16 from the same source, these Eucharistic prayer, uh, hymns by the Wesley brothers. Um, hymn number 16 draws on the patristic text of the Apostolic Constitutions, Book 8, with, with its designation of the Spirit as witness of the sufferings of Christ and now their remembrancer, the one who brings them into memory. And the hymn goes this, Come thou everlasting Spirit, Bring to every thankful mind all the Saviour's dying merit, all his suffering for mankind. True recorder of his passion, now the living faith impart. Now reveal his great salvation, preach his gospel to our heart. Come, thou witness of his dying, come, remembrancer divine. Let us feel thy power applying Christ to every soul and mine. Let us groan thine inward groaning. Look on him we pierced and grieve. All receive the grace atoning. All the sprinkled blood receive. In the current book of United Methodist Worship, United Methodist Hymnal, the first service of word and table 
contains in the great thanksgiving address to God the Father the hint towards an epiclesis before the institution narrative. It goes thus, When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And then the epiclesis proper follows on the anamnesis and oblation. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now I move from those Eucharistic prayers specifically to prayers to all three persons of the Trinity. It was hinted at the start that prayers might be addressed simultaneously to all three persons of the Trinity. That's the case, of course, with the Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Another example occurs in the TDM Laudamus. The Holy Church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee, the Father of an infinite majesty, thine honorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. And there's a similar grouping of the three together, though slightly less evenly, in the Gloria in Excelsis Deo. Let me come now to prayers addressed specifically to the third person of the Trinity. Prayer may be addressed specifically to the third person of the Trinity with other and broader themes than that of the Eucharistic epiclesis. According to Basil the Great, the Holy Spirit completes or strengthens the works of God towards the world, which are all begun from the will and command of the Father and are mediated through the Son or the Word. The Byzantine Pentecostarion, the Pentecost hymn of the Byzantine Church, provides one of the most familiar hymns from the Orthodox tradition, dating perhaps from the 8th century, begins heavenly king, paraclete, king enthroned on high, thou comforter divine, blessed spirit of all truth, be nigh and make us thine. Thou art the source of life, thou art our treasure store, give us thy peace and end our strife forevermore. Descend, O holy dove, abide with us, we pray, and in the fullness of thy love, cleanse us all way. Thus the third person of the Trinity may be invoked in his capacity as creator spirit, as in the medieval hymn for Pentecost, where the cosmic and anthropological dimensions of the Spirit's work are brought together. Veni creator spiritus. And there's a 17th century translation of that hymn into English by the poet John Dryden. Create a spirit by whose aid the world's foundations first were laid. Come, visit every waiting mind. Come, pour thy joys on humankind. From sin and sorrow set us free and make thy temples worthy thee. O source of uncreated heat, the Father's promised paraclete, Thrice holy fount, thrice holy fire, our hearts with heavenly love inspire. Come and thy sacred unction bring to sanctify us while we sing. Plenteous of grace, descend from high, rich in thy sevenfold energy. Make us eternal truths receive and practice all that we believe. Give us thyself that we may see the Father and the Son by thee. Immortal honor, endless fame, Attend Almighty Father's name. The Saviour Son be glorified, who for lost man's redemption died. And equal adoration be, 
eternal paraclete to thee. Attributed to Rabanus Maurus, there is another Veni Creato Spiritus dating from the 9th century, and it was translated by the 17th century English bishop John Cousin, and it is often sung at Anglican ordinations, perhaps even occasionally at Methodists and others as well. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, enlighten by celestial fire. Thou the anointing spirit art, who dost thy sevenfold gifts impart. Thy blessed unction from above is comfort, life, and fire of love. Enable with perpetual light the dullness of our blinded sight. Anoint and cheer our soiled face with the abundance of thy grace. Keep far our foes, give peace at home. Where thou art guide, no ill can come. Then there's another one dating from the 13th century and translated into English by John Mason Neal. Come, holy paraclete, thou holy paraclete, and from thy celestial seat shed thy light and brilliancy. Father of the poor, draw near. Giver of all gifts, be here. Come, the soul's true radiancy. What is soiled, make thou poor, pure. What is wounded, work its cure. What is parched, fructify. What is rigid, gently bend. What is frozen, warmly tend. Strengthen what goes erringly. Fill thy faithful who confide in thy power to guard and guide with thy sevenfold energy. Here thy grace and virtue send. Grant salvation to the end. And in heaven, felicity. And then there's from the Italian, Bianco da Siena, Discende Amor Santo, which we Anglophones have set to Ralph Vaughan Williams' lyrical tune, Down Ampney. Come down, O love divine, seek thou this soul of mine, and visit it with thine own ardour glowing. O comforter, draw near, within my heart appear, and kindle it, thy holy flame bestowing. Then there's a soteriological hymn from Charles Wesley. Stanzas from one of Charles Wesley's many spirit hymns, rooted in salvation history and now appropriate to invocation by the assembled worshiping community. Some standards, stanzas run thus. This is one that you may know, I hope. Lord, we believe to us and ours the apostolic promise given. We wait the Pentecostal powers the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. To everyone whom God shall call, the promise is securely made. To you far off, he calls you all. Believe the word which Christ hath said. The Holy Ghost, if I depart, the Comforter shall surely come, shall make the contrite sinner's heart, his loved, his everlasting home. Assembled here with one accord, calmly we wait the promised grace, the purchase of our dying Lord, Come, Holy Ghost, and fill the place. If every one that asks may find, if still thou dost on sinners fall, come as a mighty rushing wind, great grace be now upon us all. Come now to the section on prayer in the unity of the Holy Spirit. We notice from Basil of Caesarea's justification of the older form of praise and prayer addressed to the Father through Christ in the Holy Spirit. Over the centuries, that invocation of the Spirit became frequently expanded to in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Not simply in the Holy Spirit, but in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And there the Holy Spirit's status and role figure perhaps more obviously as the locus and enablement of unity. We shall correspondingly find the Spirit prominently invoked in various causes of ecumenism even before that term became fashionable. You will, in fact, already have noticed hints through our cited texts, hints towards the concerns for ecclesial unity and worldly mission. These themes, of, themes, of course, bear a pneumatological dimension, not only in the worship of the churches, but wherever they occur in the reflection and practice of the churches. And I may just interpose here and say that I'm very glad that this evening's after dinner lecture 
is going to be precisely on unity, ecumenism. When we've been talking about the invocation of the Holy Spirit in the liturgy of the Lord's Supper, I've quietly assumed that the people who were voicing those prayers in the particular service were living and worshipping in a state of mutual koinonia, a condition that would indeed be maintained, deepened, and extended by their common participation in the Holy Communion of the sacrament. And of course, that is sadly far from always the case. And the ecumenical questions are unavoidable already under the heading of the Holy Spirit and baptism. Not surprisingly, orders of service for baptism contain ample reference to the Holy Spirit. Take, for example, those in the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church in the USA. As is usual in services of that church, the celebrant begins with a Trinitarian invocation, Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to which comes the response, Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Then the celebrant quickly opens up the baptismal theme, inviting an appropriate response from the people. Celebrant, there is one body and one spirit, people. There is one hope in God's call to us. Celebrant, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Response, one God and Father of all. As the service progresses, all participants are expected to affirm the three-part Apostles' Creed, with, of course, the third article and its pneumatological spread. The celebrant's thanksgiving over the water runs as follows. We thank you, almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through it, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. In it, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. By it we share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into his fellowship those who come to him, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then at the next words, the celebrant touches the water and prays, now sanctify this water, we pray you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those who are here cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever, amen. And the baptism then takes place. N, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And after that action has been completed, the bishop or the priest can pray over the people now newly baptized. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit, you have bestowed upon these your servants the forgiveness of sin, have raised them to the new life of grace, sustain them, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit, give them an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Then the bishop or priest places a hand on the person's head, marking on the forehead the sign of the cross, using chrism if desired, and saying to each one, N or M or whatever the name happens to be, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. I have a section now which I'm going to omit, which was the Holy Spirit and ecumenism, because I don't want to trespass too far onto the subject of this evening. Mm, three or four pages I had there, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm. <laughs> Just let me bring in as a little dig here. The, the, the developing slogan, one baptism, one church, leaves issues to be resolved and works to be achieved in matters of both faith and order before full unity can be declared 
in doctrine and discipline. There's more than unity in baptism required for the fullness of the church. And I do have to refer to here to uh, an article by me, One Baptism, One Church, question mark, agreements, differences, resolutions, in a book edited by Matthew Levering, the Oxford Book of Sacramental Theology. But I'll end now my proper conclusion, headed, The Spirit, the Saints, and the Martyrs. One final, even eschatological connection may be detected between the Holy Spirit and those Christians whose faithful witness has been sustained by the Spirit to the point of sainthood and even martyrdom. They may be invoked, not only for the sake of their example in the past, but also for their continuing personal help from within the heavenly community as enabled by the Holy Spirit, a pneumatically conveyed unity in prayer. At that point, I have perhaps summarized the theme of the whole of this lecture. What through all the constancies and varieties of history, geography, and the human condition and cultures are the ritual, liturgical, and symbolic forms in which the Father may be worshipped in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23 and 24 again. Thank you.